right, Tashmika, okay. you are ready to go. Great. Thank you so much. I am really excited to be here today. Thank you all for um, taking the time and being interested in the programs that we've created. I hope that what I share today will help kind of inspire you to think about what programs you might be able to create for the youth that you're serving in your communities. Um, the work of the Firecracker Foundation is very much inspired by survivors and what they would want and would need from the perspective of um, myself being a survivor. And so the first thing I want to want to just say before we kind of launch into this training is that um, I did not invent yoga. <laughs> um, so uh, yoga has a long, deep, rich tradition um, in a community that I do not belong to. And so I just want to honor that this is a gift and that um, I'm so grateful that yoga has been so meaningful to me. And that I'm not trying to recreate yoga um, or make it something that it is not. Um, so I just want to start by saying that if we're going to use traditional healing methods, we should recognize the communities where they come from, um, which is India, of course. Um, so I am Tajmika Torak. I am the exec executive director and founder of the Firecracker Foundation. I am a survivor of child sexual abuse and incest. I am also the mother of three boys um, and uh, the wife to a talented tile guy, none of which made the photo, um, but I did include my best friend, Lucy, who's my dog. <laughs> so, I do love my family more than this, but I just like this picture. So um, I am a semi-retired roller derby skater, um, something I like to call a kitchen witch, and I really believe in militant self-care for all of us who are out in the community loving and serving so many um, people who are hurt um, and healing. So to get started, um, trauma-sensitive yoga has um, been something that we've been doing now for three, um, well, really, it's been about four, four out of the five years um, since we launched the organization. Um, but I, you know, I would like to talk a little bit about why I decided on yoga. Um, it was really important for me as a survivor. Um, I actually stumbled into a yoga class for the first time when I was pregnant with um, my firstborn, thinking it was going to make me a really, you know, good moms go to, you know, prenatal yoga. And so <laughs> I went and I, um, my first experience was actually just a really gentle class that I fell asleep on. And I thought rather dismissively that I can, you know, take a nap at home and I wouldn't pay anybody to let me take a nap. So um, fast forward a few years, and I started skating roller derby um, at about the same time that I went back into therapy for the sexual abuse that I experienced and um, started to attend yoga sessions really as, to heal my body from all of the um, athletics that I was doing, but also um, to maintain balance, which you need when you're um, skating and hitting people on wheels. And um, so... I started to attend and I started hearing my yoga instructor say things like, what do you want from your yoga? You know, how does this pose feel? Um, why are you maintaining a, a pose that's hurting you? Where can you find ease? And it was really one of the first times that I had had someone say to me, you know, what do you want from, you know, what, what do you want from this experience with your body? how do you want your body to feel and not how should your body make other people feel or how, you know, how can you use your body to accommodate the will or the space of others? Um, and so it was really important to me. Um, it was really um, where I started to establish a loving relationship with my body that was not rooted in my sexuality or um, the way that it made other people feel. And for those of you um, who have an understanding of sexual trauma, you know that there's so much uh, disassociation that happens in our bodies where we literally disconnect from our bodies as survivors because we view our bodies as the enemy. And so it was through my yoga practice that I discovered that my body was actually my home, and it was a space for me to um, restore um, a lot of the, the places where I had been harmed. Um, and so I, when I started this organization, I was thinking about all of the things that 
worked for me um, as I healed and how we could create those things um, for children and youth in my area. And so I partnered with um, Just Be Yoga, which is a yoga studio um, actually right in my neighborhood. And um, lucky for me, my yoga instructor is a trauma-sensitive yoga instructor. And so we started to imagine what it would look like to offer this um, to teens. So um, before I talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of the program, um, I want to just establish some of the things that we think about when we're creating programs, because not all of you are here because you're super jazzed about offering yoga. There may be some other things um, that you are interested in bringing to your um, clients. And so whether it's collage making or dancing or um, pop culture, we uh, joke a lot about how pop culture is actually kind of like a salve sometimes um, and can be really healing <laughs> if used in the right way, obviously. Um, animals, we've, you saw our first picture, and there, we've brought um, goats into the yoga studio. We've had kittens come in. We've had dogs. Um, but there's also um, equine therapy. Um, and there are so many other things. I mean, I think we have a sense of, of the things that um, heal trauma, but asking the survivors that you work with of all ages, you know, what does, you know, how are you surviving right now? Um, just last year, I was in a uh, session with Luz Benbo, and she was speaking directly to um, Afro Latinas and asking um, us, how, how did we make it through as survivors? What were the things that kept us alive? And it was really interesting because I don't think anybody besides myself had ever asked me outside of the normative um, therapy sessions and counseling, what were the things that kept me alive um, during the time that I was um, being abused and and after when I didn't have access to therapy. And so I think one of the important things about um, how we start yoga um, and how we start all of the programs at the Firecracker Foundation is really from a space of curiosity about what is already serving our clients and how can we create um, or, or bring those things into their healing practice. I think that most things that are trauma-informed or trauma-aware um, are things that are considerate of what are the things that are already bolstering the healing of your clients. So yoga was very much about that um, for our program. We really wanted to create something that um, – could be another healing uh, program for them from a space of, of letting them investigate their body and, and discover whether or not it works for them. Um, so when we, did, when we uh, got started, um, of course, we had to start thinking about who, who was going to be the instructors that would run this program. Uh, yoga at the time in our area was offered, uh, you know, pretty, pretty regularly and pretty across the board, but trauma sensitive yoga in our area wasn't necessarily something that was being offered um, very much. There were only two instructors that I knew of at the time. And of course you're always limited by your own knowledge um, that were offering uh, trauma informed classes and um, not necessarily specifically to children. Um, And so it really became um, looking around at other yoga contractors. um, We contract our our yoga instructors, but looking around at the experience in the area. So we had to look at, um, we had to ask for resumes, uh, we had to look at their training, and we had to look at studio time uh, experience. And so um, there are lots of special considerations when you think about uh, trauma-informed yoga Um, And just yoga in general, we have yoga for larger bodies. We have yoga that's created specifically for people who have disordered eating um, and people who practice self-harm. We have yoga for um, addictions. And so we really looked at what, where did our yoga instructors come from in terms of how do they find their way into doing some kind of trauma-sensitive yoga? Because as you know, that... um, trauma manifests in lots of ways, and there's a lot of intersections between those trainings and what we do. Um, And so we, you know, we know that a lot of teens who have experienced some form of sexual violence 
are um, going to have an eating disorder or may in the future. We know that many of them will um, have problems with addiction or mental health issues. Um, we know that all of those things are connected. And so we didn't necessarily look at resumes through the lens of, you know, who has the best trauma-informed um, uh, training. We looked at it kind of from the perspective of, what, how, what is their entry point in working with people who have trauma and how can we bolster their work? So um, the, we, considered the, we considered that because we were not in a community that had a lot of people that were already trained in the way that maybe um, some of our larger cities and areas were um, trained or their instructors were trained. So we looked around at the pay structure to see, you know, how much yoga instructors were being paid for services, um, and that was the, that's something that I recommend, too, when you're building your budget. Um, I'm assuming many of you are going to have to fundraise for a new program or have to write grants, and so this was a big piece of it, establishing how much we're going to pay people. Um, and I really wanted to, um, especially being a woman of color myself and um, a cisgender woman, I wanted to make sure that we were paying people a reasonable amount. There is definitely the perception that yoga instructors will just work for free um, and live off of good karma. <laughs> no one lives off of good karma. <laughs> so I really wanted to make sure that we were being competitive, um, but also um, paying in a way that, um, you know, lifts up justice and equity in the work that we're doing because people who work with um, people who are hurting and healing don't deserve to suffer themselves because they've decided to do that work. So that was kind of how we decided. So we pay somewhere in between um, 50 and $75 an hour um, for an hour session where they report uh, weekly um, and monthly. So weekly reports, um, since we're going down to reporting, let me know who was in attendance, what was the progress, um, are there any concerns that we need to address, was there any crisis information that needs to be passed on, um, is there anything, any recommendation that might need to go to that client therapist. Um, and then the monthly overall reports are generally um, the, uh, an accumulation of all of that with just an overall viewpoint. Did everything go well? Did they attend? Is there anything we need to, do, need to know? And are there other recommendations? So are there any, um, you know, is yoga not working for them? Do they have um, issues that don't allow them to be in a group session? Should we consider individual yoga sessions? Um, is it best to start this client in therapy to build up some skills um, before they join a yoga session? So the monthly overall reports is really where we gain um, a lot of the insight into what's, what's working and what's not working for our clients and what are the recommendations from our yoga instructors. Um, the other thing that we've been able to do through our funding is offer scholarships to our yoga instructors. So as I mentioned, our area wasn't necessarily just, um, you know, full of yoga instructors who had these skills um, or who were interested in working with children because it's not just about the skills. It's also about people who want to work with not just children but children who um, have experienced trauma and are maybe not going to be um, well behaved in, in the way that um, – other children might be or understand boundaries in the way that other children might understand them. Um, and so they're not likely going to be neurotypical. And so it's not just about having the skills or wanting to work with children. It's about wanting to work with children who have experienced trauma and how that, um, how that manifests in a yoga studio space. Um, we uh, joke that, you know, kids feel safe and then they feel safe enough to act a fool. And, um, <laughs> With, with, you know, when kids uh, know that they can uh, trust you and they feel safe, then they want to test it. And they're like, can I trust you? What if I do this thing or that thing? Can I still trust you um, to be there and, and hold this space for me? And so it's definitely not something for every yoga instructor. Um, and we'll go into um, the different um, things that go into a trauma-sensitive yoga session that might explain that a little bit more. Um, but what we were able to do is set aside um, money so that when yoga instructors wanted to uh, increase their skill base um, in any number of ways, 
then we would be able to have them apply for a scholarship and our program development committee um, along with myself would review that, determine whether or not it was a good fit for, the, for our clients and then pay for them to attend those trainings. Um, we sent a group of yoga instructors um, and a member of my staff to the Yoga for Kids conference last year in DC. We host regular webinars on everything from, uh, we just did one for working with um, interpreters because we are um, starting to offer yoga for children who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and so we're trying to build their skills in all kinds of ways so that it's not just, um, it, it's not something where we're, we assume that they're ready um, to do this forever without any support, just like none of us are, can continue to work in this field without continuous development on our skills um, for working with children and families. So does anybody have any questions so far? You can put your question in the chat box since all the lines are muted. I don't have any at this point, Ashnika, but um, I have been muted myself and uh, laughing, which I know is <laughs> um, at, at your jokes, which I, I think can be validating when you're talking into a very silent. <laughs> into the void. Um. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I'm gonna if you have questions going. for Tashmika, go ahead and put it in the participant feedback box. Yeah, and I'll keep going, and I, I have no problem coming back um, to okay, uh, totally any know. questions. So this is um, a group of our um, of yogis and teens who participated in what we um, we do um, yoga demos. So something that we host in our community is an opportunity for yoga instructors who are curious about working with kids um, and curious about working with us. Um, can come in and participate and learn a little bit more from um, Belinda. That's our yoga, one of our yoga instructors. Uh, we have um, 10 total yoga instructors now that we contract with. Um, they are absolutely not full-time, so all of that sounds like a lot of people. Um, we, you know, have them working in schools, um, also on site, and then at some of our partner organization spaces. So, um, this was an opportunity for teens to try it out or parents or DHS workers who are thinking about referring to us. So this is a way that we've gotten out into the community and really in introduced people to the concept of trauma-sensitive yoga and what it means um, and how it's practiced. Um, and so if you're looking for ways um, for any of your programs really to introduce them and to find funders and to find partners, I recommend that this is um, something that has worked for us. Um, and that we enjoy um, answering questions um, and allowing people to practice sometimes for the first time before they invite teens who know, love, and trust them to participate as well, which I think is really important. I try not to um, invite people or ask people to do things that I wouldn't do myself or that I haven't experienced. And I know that when you're in a trusted position with teens and children and families, um, that that's uh, an important thing to do. So. So I wanted to talk through a little bit about the elements of trauma-sensitive yoga. For those of you who are not uh, yoga people or yogis or practice um, or who actively avoid uh, yoga <laughs> for whatever reason, um, I wanted to share a little bit about what uh, your youth should be able to expect from a trauma-sensitive yoga class. Um, although I cannot say that we are um, – at, by any means the standard or uh, setting the standard, but this is what we do and, um, and it's all based on really important things. So, and I'll describe that as, as I go through them. So we um, set up our space in, um, in a circle. It's always a circle because we don't want people standing behind one another. Um, there's a sense of security that comes from not having someone standing at your back and being able to face everyone and also being able to see the instructor from every point of the room um, because she's also in the circle or she, he, they, they are always in the circle. Um, we also make sure that all of the exits are visible and made known to attendees or participants. So one of the first things that is said is here is your door to the left. If you leave that door, you will find uh, the bathroom or the waiting room um, or whatever, and here is the door to your right, and that door will take you out to the parking lot, whatever it may be. Um, 
creating um, expectations that are constant is really important. Also letting people know that you don't have to ask permission to leave the space if you are feeling uncomfortable or triggered and you need to take a break. Uh, you are the boss of yourself and we love and respect you and know that you know what's best for you and your body. Um, we typically, when we were having this uh, in the early days when we were doing this uh, in a yoga studio, we would typically have a volunteer waiting out in the waiting room just in case we had a teen or a child that needed a break uh, for whatever reason. Sometimes that reason is not emotional or, or um, mental health issues. It may just be that they are a seven-year-old who has a hard time regulating um, their energy and they just need to take a walk around the, the school hallway. We've definitely had that happen before where we just, you know, they need a walk. They need to shake it out. They got, they got um, what we call the sillies. <laughs> so sometimes that's what, what they need to do, and that's fine. Um, space is well lit, uncluttered, and not overly heated. Um, so we don't have spaces. This is not a hot yoga class. Um, it is always, the lights are always on, so everything is really well. Uh, you know, it's very visible. It's not overly heated. Um, having an overly heated space can be really triggering um, if you're hot and you can't breathe. Um, and we don't want a lot of things in the space, um, and we don't have mirrors. Um, so this is not like an advanced studio. Um, we've actually covered mirrors um, so that people are not feeling insecure. This is all about creating security and um, safeness. And so we um, definitely know that um, – you know, having a lot of distractions for our little ones is not a good idea. <laughs> so, you know, um, that can always be a challenge, but we try to keep the space open for them. Um, there's also a, um, space available for alternatives to movement. Um, we are giving um, kids the opportunity to practice yoga, but sometimes they're just not that into it that day, and they really need rest, and they really need to have a, a quiet space for themselves. And so, we will um, allow them meditation CDs. We will set up the bol bolsters in a corner so that if someone wants to practice their shavasana or their coach pose where they just lay down for a while, um, that's totally cool too. And so we try to give people the opportunity to have those spaces for safe alternatives to actively participating in the session. We don't use heavy or intense smell, so no incense uh, or oils that are super intense. Um, we don't know, um, and until we get to know the clients um, and what their likes, dislikes, triggers are, we try to stay away from that. Eventually, of course, when you get to know the people in your class, you can kind of make that judgment call. And then for supplies, we have bolsters, blocks, mats, um, and blankets. A lot of our kids really enjoy having blankets that they can wrap up in, um, which I know for me, I love, I love that as well. Um, so I um, before I go on, were there any questions? Yeah, there's a couple here. One is from Kelly who says, you may have already mentioned this, and I may have missed it, but I was wondering how you had these, indiv how you had these individuals or found out that they were trauma-sensitive or trauma-informed or what sort of training they went through. I'm assuming it's similar to the training we went through as advocates, but I'm curious. Sure. So there are special trainings um, that – yoga instructors can go through, and we always ask for a resume um, that goes through, obviously, their, their history and their experience. Um, no, there's not a training that I would recommend, per se. I know that there's some through the Yoga Alliance, um, and there are other organizations that um, offer trauma-sensitive training, but what I have learned is that um, it really is um, something that has to do with the individual yoga instructor and how they embrace it. Just like in every other training, there's, um, you know, you can call a lot of things trauma-informed, um, but it's really in the practice and theory. And so another thing that we have done is we've attended their yoga um, classes as another way of vetting our yoga instructors, um, and ha we have an interview process as well. So that's kind of how we figure out who is um, trauma, a trauma-informed yoga instructor. Kind of like both the, the hard and soft skills, right, Tashmika? Right, right, exactly. Um, the second question is from Trisha, um, who says, I would love the form of questions you use on the weekly uh, with the yoga therapist. Or 
Yeah, so we are not, um, the, the questions are actually not something we created. They're actually created by our yoga instructors. And really what it, for the weekly, it's more so um, here are all of the things that we did in yoga this week. And here are how all of the children responded to those activities. Um, and here are some of the things that I noticed. I noticed that X um, child was um, really um, hard on their body this week um, when I asked them to sit down um, or um, join a posture where you're sitting. They really slammed themselves on the ground, and I had to give them a reminder to be gentle with themselves, just something to note, you know, or so-and-so really – couldn't engage in the yoga class this week and really wanted to spend the whole class just wrapped up in their yoga blanket. Um, so, you know, just wanted to give you a heads up. Maybe there's something going on there. And so it's really just an indicator for the therapist to ask deeper questions about what's going on. We're just starting the process of connecting our yoga instructors to our therapist um, and kind of um, evolving and evaluating that process as we go. So that's kind of where we've started, if that makes sense. Um, and I'm realizing, I don't know that she can tell me that makes sense, but I guess you can ask another question if that, that didn't answer. I hope it did. Yeah, Trisha, um, go ahead and put anything in the chat box if there was more things that you wanted to know from that. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so are there, is there anything else? Trisha said, this is great, thank you. Oh, good. Perfect. Um, so um, here is our... Um, one of our yoga instructors uh, dabbing with some of our students in a school. Um, I'm sorry that the picture is a little fuzzy, um, but I wanted to show you this is where they were doing yoga. So although I just told you about all of the perfect ways that our yoga session um, could go, obviously this classroom is a typical classroom, and it's got stuff in it, and there are things on the walls, and there's, you know, there's desks in there. Um, but our kids somehow manage to still um, use the space. So I just want to encourage you, if you are an organization that um, doesn't have, you know, a yoga studio in your space or access to one, you don't have to be perfect to do tr transformative work. Um, and our kids have done well in school spaces and also in yoga studio spaces. I think it's the way that we hold the space together that makes it really important. Um, you know, I, perfection is the enemy of good. Isn't that what they always say? So um, look at those perfect little kids doing yoga. So, it, well, they're not, I mean, I don't know if a dab could be considered yoga, but today, that day it was. <laughs> uh, but they are building relationship, which I think is beautiful. So um, the other elements of trauma-sensitive yoga. So um, we do have guardians, uh, parents and guardians sign a waiver for uh, legal reasons, obviously. Um, and to be clear, we do have clients who um, they have to have um, their um, caseworker sign it because they're not with their parents currently, um, and we have had guardians. Um, we have had probation officers bring uh, their uh, wards um, to a yoga class. Um, so uh, we just try to make sure we have someone sign that this child um, can do yoga um, and that if something happens that we're not held liable, um, of course, whatever the language is, the small print. Um, so we, have, we do have a, a waiver that we ask them to sign. We ask that all of the um, kids in the session wear clothing that covers primary and secondary sex organs. Um, the reason why we ask for this is because we know that body parts can also be triggering. So this is in no way a judgment of our kids, or, and it's, it's across the board. It doesn't matter what gender um, is presenting. We just want to make sure that we're keep, um, being considerate of everyone in the class and making sure that body parts are not triggering anyone. So T-shirts and shorts are fine. Um, you know, sweats are fine. Yoga pants are fine. We just want to make sure everything is covered for everybody. Um, and that includes our instructors. Our instructors also follow that, um, the, you know, those same guidelines. So every session has two instructors or a responsible party, whether that be a staff member or a volunteer um, who waits in the, in the waiting area. Um, there's usually a lead instructor and then an assistant um, who supports the lead instructor in their work. Um, 
that can be a yoga instructor, or it could also be a staff volunteer or a therapist. We've had all of those scenarios work really well for us. Um, the important thing is that the lead instructor is, um, you know, supported in their role and that whoever is uh, assisting has an understanding of the elements of trauma-sensitive tra uh, yoga. We actually do have um, Belinda uh, from Just Be Yoga does run a training for people who um, want to assist as well. So um, all postures are optional. Uh, consent language is key in the trauma-sensitive yoga program. And what I mean by that is um, Belinda and many of our other yoga instructors use language around um, owning your no. A lot of our kids have not been able to own their no or it hasn't been respected by um, a caregiver or a perpetrator. And so we really want to um, offer them the opportunity to give and rescind consent and to have an adult in the room respect that consent. So in a yoga, in a trauma sensitive yoga session, you will likely hear someone say something like, if it feels good, we're now going to, you know, lean over and touch our toes, you know, or whatever, you know, whatever the posture is. Um, and if it doesn't feel good, you're welcome to stay where you are, or you can go into child's pose, or you can just lay down. Whatever you need in your body is the right answer in yoga. Um, we don't do any physical touch or posture correction or, or for posture correction. Um, that's really limited to when we are seeing someone do something that might cause injury. And even then, it, it doesn't happen without consent. Um, so we have used permission stones in the past where, you know, they can choose a permission stone and put it on their mat if they're okay with having an instructor correct them physically. Um, but mostly uh, our um, instructors will use mirroring rather than touching to kind of show them how to correct their body. Um, and touch is kind of a last ditch effort to get them um, into the right position that won't hurt them. But usually kids can, you know, they usually can figure it out before we get to the point where we need to physically um, support their movement. So every um, session, um, and when I say session, I mean um, like an eight-week session uh, or a 16-week session um, starts with setting up ground rules. So um, kids work together to create their own ground rules, um, and then every week they're able to return to those ground rules. So ground rules can also address and have addressed when, um, so back to consent. We often say to kids um, and teens that their yoga mat is their island. No one belongs on their island except for them. No one should get on their island without permission. Yeah. Um, and so let's just say we have a child or a teen that doesn't respect that boundary um, and causes some form of harm, then the ground rules can also address um, accountability. Um, what happens if someone does that? Um, and how do we feel afterwards about inviting that person back in? What are going to be the, what's the conversation about um, allowing that person back into the space? What are our expectations? And so it really also gives children the opportunity to talk about conflict and how we resolve conflicts that keeps everybody in a way that keeps everybody safe. So um, they are all, have also been really silly ground rules. I mean, silly depending on how you feel about stinky feet, but we've had kids say like, no stinky feet on my mat, which I think is a total legit ground rule for yoga. Um, but they, <laughs> they have lots of really interesting ground rules depending on the age of, um, of the, the kids in the class. And so that's been really fun. So we usually use a white, um, you know, one of the post-it, the big post-its, and we stick it to the wall, and then we take it out of the room and then post it back up for every individual class because not every class has the same ground rules. And so we, um, we rotate them in, in and out of the room um, for each individual class. Um, and the last thing is we really do recommend that our kids do have access to a therapist if they're participating in yoga. Um, because we also offer mental health therapy um, and we are, are in a, a space or, or a community where there, there are other organizations that do, we really try to make sure that they're connected to someone just in case um, they need additional support. And we like to know that they're working uh, through therapy at the same time that they're participating in yoga um, so that we're not um, triggering something or heightening something um, or doing any harm um, that doesn't get resolved um, through working through therapy as well. Um, 
So that's a pretty important piece for us too. Hey, Tashmika. Um, yeah. That's a good um, kind of segue to a question that Maya has here about mm -hmm. what expectations do young people have around how they practice yoga and to what extent that will be shared? Do they, have, do they consent to have that, their participation and behavior in yoga shared with the therapist, and how does that kind of... I'm, I'm hearing you say that they both work for the Firecracker Foundation, so it's like internal, right, communication, or what's the... What's yes, the, so uh, we definitely... Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So, yes, we definitely communicate that. We have a perspective around doing work that is um, holistic, and we're definitely not there yet. We're still figuring it out. But we're working on trying to um, – so we do have them sign a waiver. Um, and because yoga is not something that is like therapy um, uh, that is bound by uh, confidentiality and HIPAA um, and things like that, there are, there's obviously no legal reason why we can't share, but I, but I don't think that matters, right? We're honoring the healing work, and so we try to make sure that the um, that we're not sharing anything that there's not consent for. So I'm glad you brought that up. So we definitely get permission from the family and from um, you know also the therapist and the yoga instructor to make sure that they are comfortable working together. Um, but we we have a waiver for that. And then, if it's okay, there's another question from Anna about what does the parent's role look, look like, um, you know, in, um, with the, the youth that you're working with? What's their role? Are they involved in any way? Sure. So we actually do – that's a really good question. Um, we actually start all of our sessions. So if we're doing a 15-week session, um, the first session, we ask the parents to arrive about 15 minutes early, um, and then um, – depending on the group of parents and how, um, how open they are to trauma-sensitive yoga, we will either take them through materials that talks about why we've chosen yoga, um, what are the expectations um, in terms of, like, please don't, you know, feed them um, a really heavy meal before yoga because we don't want anybody to throw up after <laughs> moving a lot. Um, you know, uh, you know, take out jewelry, just like the expectations you have for any type of physical movement. Um, but we may also invite them in to do um, very simple uh, yoga demo. Sometimes it's just in their chairs. Um, and then depending on the session and our partners, um, and I, by that I mean our partner organizations, we may also invite them in um, to participate midway through as a support person for the um, students, so um, or for um, for the for the children or the teens. Um, and so that can be a way that they partner. We've had with individual yoga sessions, we've been able to bring parents in and teach them the same skills that we're teaching their kids, which has been really wonderful um, because, of course, they can take that information home with them. So it really runs the gamut. Um, as you know, working with parents, uh, it really, really depends on who the parents are. Um, actually, in this next slide, um, I'm going to skip down because the question came up. Um, we don't allow anyone to participate in sessions without, uh, with our clients without their consent. That includes parents. So we don't always um, – you are probably already know this, and I'm preaching to the choir, but we can't assume that the relationship with that parent, regardless of, uh, regardless of them being a non-offending parent, um, is a safe one that we can invite into what the client considers to be a safe space. Um, and so we offer them the opportunity, but we do not pressure our clients to invite their parents into the space. Um, and that goes for guardians or teachers um, or siblings. We have had clients that wanted to bring their sister or brother in, and so that's been really great because we know that they're probably experiencing some vicarious trauma and they can also share those skills. Um, we've had teachers and principals of schools um, want to attend yoga classes with the clients, and we've told them no um, because the kids didn't want them to come. Um, and so we are talking a lot about, when we talk about consent, we're also talking about teaching our adult um, support people about the autonomy of the children um, in our care. And so we really try to respect their boundaries. So um, I hope that answers the question. But basically the answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends on that parent um, or that guardian. So I hope that answers your question. Um, 
And so uh, the next thing that I was going to talk about is age and gender considerations. One of the questions that we, uh, a lot of the questions we get when we talk about yoga is around, you know, who can be in the yoga, what ages. So we currently have two programs. We have Little Sparks for children 12 and under, and then Rising Phoenix for our teens that are in, the, uh, in between the ages of 13 and 17. Um, so obviously we're not going to put a four-year-old in with a 12-year-old. Um, unless they're related, and even sometimes, even if they're related, it's not a good idea to put them together. Um, so we tend to build our programming um, ages by who is signed up at the moment. So if we have, um, you know, if we have children six, you know, six, five, and seven, we'll run a session with that age group for a time until we have a different age dynamic show up for us. Um, same for the teens. Um, we, we try to make sure that the ages match um, and you, we don't have a really, uh, you know, a 17 year old in with, you know, 13 year olds if we can, if we can allow for more space. And then sometimes it's beneficial to have an older teen in there. It, we really pay attention to the dynamics um, and the behavior of all of the, the children. So um, the youth that attend do not necessarily need to share the same gender, but that depends heavily on the individuals participating. I, um, I have had sessions where we have four boys and two girls, um, are, they're identified and they have zero problems with it and it goes wonderful. Um, and I have clients that are like, there's no way you're gonna put a boy in class with me. Um, and I have had gender non-conforming non teens who um, are in a class with all uh, girls um, that have identified as, as female. and so. It really just depends on um, your kids and knowing your kids and what they need. Um, and so sometimes that means we can't have a teen in that session um, and we try to accommodate, but we have to be attentive to what everybody needs and how everyone is gonna feel safe. Um, and then when we do um, our registration, we're attentive to triggers, um, how our teens or children can respect boundaries. We know that boundaries is our, um, boundaries are a huge issue. Um, for children who experience trauma, um, especially our little ones. Um, and so we're, we're attentive to that, and, and that also helps us make our decision around our, our group session formation. We try to make sure that we're, um, you know, doing the best for the most of the kids, for the majority of the kids that are, that are participating in group. Um, and if we can't always accommodate, then we will put um, – we, we have the option to do individual sessions when, when we have someone who needs it and can't um, participate in the group for whatever reason. Um, so before I go on, are there any other questions? Yeah, uh, Lydia is asking, what is the youngest ch a child has been in one of the trauma-informed yoga classes? The youngest is about four that we've had. And then uh, Molly asks, um, as far as the therapy aspect goes, what type of trauma treatment um, do you all use or do your therapists use? Um, most of them are TSDBT trained, uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, um, but we are open um, to play therapy and we're starting to um, incorporate um, somatic um, movement therapy as well as some art and music are on the horizon. So those are going to be options at our center pretty soon. And it's for the youngest that you will accept, or is it all case by case, like you, it can go younger? Yeah, I think it's all case by case. I think it would be um, really hard below. I think three is probably the youngest, I would think, depending on how old that three-year-old is. But I think four is about the age, um, age limit. Great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I just thought I'd throw this slide in here because we're talking a lot about, um, you know, or I've brought up consent several times. And so um, I really, really believe that one of the most uh, important sort of lessons or experiences that come out of trauma-sensitive yoga is allowing kids to practice consent. Um, and have it be practiced in a space that is safe where it will be um, acknowledged and respected. Um, and so we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, what consent means. And I love this graphic 
probably because I love French fries, but also because it's a really great, easy way to, to remember and to teach consent to teens and kids. Um, and so there, as I mentioned before, we learn a lot from just doing this practice and for, for um, bringing this into classrooms. We have learned so much in the past um, you know, four years, um, but we learn a lot from our kids. You know, we learn, um, we, I once had a therapist um, ask us about a client who um, would always come into the class probably for like the first three or four weeks of an eight-week session and just get on their mat and roll up in a blanket, and that was the function of their yoga class. That's all they did. Um, and was just curious, the therapist was just curious and was like, are they actually getting anything out of it? And my response was that they were able to go into a space and say no and have that be the lesson, right? And they knew that no one in that space was going to try to force them to get up or do anything um, or be disrespectful about their choice. Um, and so I think that that's something that's been really powerful. We also have learned from our students or from our, um, our clients things like using the word um, grounding. Like when, whenever we go into a yoga space, we're all like, yeah, let's get grounded. And the kids are like, I don't want to be grounded <laughs> because it means a totally different thing to them. Um, so there's, there's little things like that um, that are really important. Um, there's also um, – you know, we don't use the word um, pose. We use the word posture because children and teens who have experienced um, trafficking, using the word pose um, can be really triggering um, for a lot of um, really terrifying reasons. And so we have learned so much, um, you know, about working with um, different kids, but also working with different adults, which is why I can talk a little bit about, you know, what it means to bring parents into the room and, and educators and, um, and how they communicate. Um, so when we work, you know, when we work in schools versus when we work at um, a, um, a space where the clients are actually living versus in our own space. So there's lots of things to learn about doing this practice. And I think that if we're attentive to our clients um, and to their families and to the programs who are working with them, you just kind of start start holding those things and adding them into your um, knowledge base so that in the future you can um, offer something even better every time. So um, we do have, uh, we are in the space where we're starting to evaluate. Um, we are starting to implement, we always do, so there's like this language around evaluation um, that is very, um, formal and, and um, science-y. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm going to say these words, but I'll, I'll try to, like, talk about it in the way that it happened before we started actually thinking about evaluation. So we do pre- and post-check-ins. And what that looks like in yoga is we start in a circle and we ask, you know, how are you feeling in your body today? What do you need from your yoga today? Um, a post-check-in might be, what, you know, how did you get what you needed from your yoga today? How can we support you um, in the week ahead? Is there anything that you need? Is what's going on with your family that, that we can, um, is there anything that we can do for your family in this in-between time? Um, we do um, intake assessments. So obviously we have families come in and we, we do an intake with all of them to kind of get an idea of what's going on, how much court involvement are they dealing with right now, who else is in the home, you know, all of the things that you ask as an advocate um, uh, so that we have an understanding of what's going on when they come in. Um, we're, this is the part that we're working on. We're looking at engaging our clients, their family members, and their support team, um, which would include their therapists, to kind of gauge progress um, or areas for improvement. So yoga, um, as I said earlier, is a thousand years old practice that is really rooted in um, uh, spirituality um, and is very sacred. And so I don't want to leave you with the impression that there is like a way to win at yoga because that's a very, um, that's a very kind of Western way of looking at, at this practice that is, that is not actually um, – kind of something that you can check boxes off and be like, I did yoga perfect today. It's not how it works. 
But at the same time, we do know that it does offer our kids um, a way to regulate their emotions through their breath work. We know that they um, have a way of seeing their body differently when they practice yoga. And we know that, they ha that we are imparting ideas that are going to serve them in the future around consent and bodily autonomy. And so these are the kind of questions that we're asking when we're thinking about evaluation. Um, evaluation, although I understand, um, and I, you know, even for our yoga instructors, it's been a difficult kind of idea, how do we take this beautiful sacred tradition that we know is working and uh, evaluate it so that we can get funding and communicate the value of our work um, has been, it's been kind of a difficult conversation. But the truth is we do need to communicate our value so that we can fund our work. Um, because like I said earlier, no one is eating good karma or paying their bills with it. So, um, <laughs> well, maybe some people are, but, <laughs> you know, we have a program to build and we want to make sure that it's, um, we can help as many kids as possible. And so we're really looking at how we define success for a holistic vision. So is this working? Are our therapists benefiting from the information from the yoga instructors? Um, are our children and their families feeling a foundation of support that is giving them tools and skills that will help them overcome the experiences and the, um, the symptoms of trauma that they're dealing with? Um, and so that's kind of how we're thinking about evaluation. Are there any other questions before I go on? Um, Tashmika, I had one, but uh, I've lost it, so I'll come back and the one that's in my head. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I am going to send you guys a video about our program. So we uh, created a video for the organization, and there is um, there are some parents on there talking about what yoga has meant to them. And so when you get the email with this webinar, uh, link, you'll be able to watch it um, and learn a little bit more about, um, or at least hear about it from some of our clients. So at this point, um, I wanted back. to open it up to questions. It came back to you, okay. It came back to me. <laughs> so you've been talking a lot about safety in this, in this um, um, really important way, you know, that is so different for sexual assault and sexual abuse survivors, you know, about um, things like knowing where the exits are and things like that, which I, I really appreciate. The other thing you, you had mentioned about shavasana or um, like constructive rest pose and those kind of really grounding, like legs up the wall kind of things. I wonder if that's part of like um, the ways that you might plan with um, some of the kids that are in your um, um, classes about like in the in-between times, how they might be able to be, um, well, not grounded in the bad way, but <laughs> grounded in the, yeah. you know, to rooted. help regulate I I did, yeah. feelings and emotions. I and if you, you know, if they have a plan about different um, postures that work for them or something like that. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, I know that our yoga instructors will offer up things like that for our students to take home with them um, that are specific to each Clients. So we have really adventurous clients. I've heard stories of them kicking frames off the wall because they love the head, you know, headstands and <laughs> things like that. And then we have clients that really just need to step away from their phone and sit in quiet. It just really depends on the client. But we definitely, um, all of our students get their own uh, yoga mat and they get their own journal. And so our instructors have been known to offer up some form of, um, you know, for lack of a better word, homework um, or an opportunity to practice something at home. Um, we have had clients who really um, enjoy the Overman Sphere. I don't know if anybody, if all of you know what that is, um, but it's basically, it looks like a little Lego ball that when you pull it, it opens and shuts, but we use it as a, a, a way to um, create a visible uh, example of how we inhale and exhale slowly to teach them um, some of the breath work. And so there are, all, there are all things like that that definitely get sent home for sure. I'm trying to think. There was something else that I was going to say about uh, the practice. Um, Can you say the name of that ball again? It's an Oberman Sphere. Uh, sphere. It's called H or it's spelled H-O-B-E-R-M-A-N. Um, sphere. 
It's super fun. The kids really like it. We also keep, you know, we have a singing bowl and chimes. Um, we have a box of cards um, that are called um, yoga pretzel cards. And yoga pretzel cards, it's like a stack, a, a deck of postures. And sometimes with our, with our younger kids and even with our, really with all of our kids, um, we allow them to choose a posture. You know, they can go through the cards and be like, I would like to try this one today. Um, so that can be really fun. There's a lot of games. There are a lot of yoga games um, that our teachers, um, instructors pull into the sessions um, with them, which I think is really fun. The younger kid yoga class often just sounds like a bunch of kids giggling, <laughs> which I really enjoy. Um, but there's lots of yoga games that they're doing um, we also have a mini um, trampoline in our uh, gathering space and our uh, basically where this picture is um, so that when kids are needing to get out some of their sillies, they can come out into the waiting room and jump on a little mini tram trampoline. That's another thing that we do with them to create space for whatever their bodies need. Um, I think that's it. Are there any other questions? No? Uh, I, I'm waiting for um, folks to type in their questions, and then I can ask them. Um, in the interim, I have all kinds of questions, so I can keep okay. asking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, one of them is about, you had mentioned, like, sometimes a probation officer might bring somebody. Um, mm -hmm. And I was just wondering about how you connect with some of, your, some of the systems um, in mm -hmm. your community to get them to buy into and use the, the services of the Firecracker Foundation um, mm -hmm. when you're trying to work with like really sometimes mainstream systems to get them to buy into like the trauma-informed um, uh, yoga and things like that. Yeah, so we started hosting those yoga demos in the community. We've actually done yoga demos with our um, local school board. We've done them out in the community. We've actually gone into um, – different spaces. We've, you know, gone into um, programs for teens to allow them to try it. We've gone um, into different organizations and, and done it for, um, you know, people within the organizations. And we've just given presentations to explain kind of why yoga is so important um, and so helpful for, for kids that are healing. But really what it comes down to is having someone who is a champion in that organization. Um, we have, although we don't necessarily have a huge community of yoga instructors teaching trauma-sensitive yoga to teens and kids, we definitely have a pretty wide um, community of yoga instructors and people who love yoga who work at these different entities, and they have definitely championed yoga within their, within their own programs. Um, and so our relationship to community mental health has really been established um, through an individual who works at community mental health and who came to one of our demos and wanted to bring it to their clients. Um, our work with Angel House, which is with teens and um, teen moms or pregnant teens, um, are, was established again through someone who came to a demo or who, someone who really loved yoga for themselves and wanted to bring it to the teens. And so I would recommend it is important to have relationships with, with um, you know, partners and organizations for sure. Um, that's never not going to be important, but um, one of the things that I've found in doing this work is finding the right champion for yoga, um, you know, because even like, for example, I mentioned community mental health, and I've also mentioned um, the Lansing School uh, District. Um, they're a huge organization, and we do not work with the entire organization, and so my hope is and my goal is over the next um, several years as to now that we've had really great successes within these classrooms and, and within these smaller pieces of these larger organizations that it will start to grow and we'll start to invite more um, participants into the future. Thanks, Tashmika. I, I also was wondering if you might share, and this is not related to your um, trauma-sensitive um, yoga program, but the I think that it's um, really important and um, it, 
I think it's really meaningful the the support that you all did for the victims of Larry Nassar when in Michigan. And I'm wondering if you can mention how you came together as a community to support those victims and kind of what your plan was and your thought process was about responding to that kind of really high profile case that just popped up in your community. Um, would you feel comfortable sharing that? Sure, yeah, no, I, yeah, I would. Um, so we, for those of you who are not familiar, um, we um, are the community where Larry Nassar um, lived and um, perpetrated on over, um, well, 250 plus um, young women and girls. Um, and so we recently um, saw his sentencing and um, weeks of testimony from different survivors. They, the, um, their testimony was covered live um, throughout the media. Um, it's been a really, in that was a really intense time for them and their families. And, you know, we as an organization were just thinking about ways that we could support them, you know, as the sentencing actually came down. And so we invited volunteers and community members and we partnered with an organization called In Violent Encounters, EVE, um, the local domestic violence shelter. Um, and asked them to bring the community together and we held um, signs. We stood outside and just really, um, you know, that really encouraged them and, and celebrated how brave they had been to, to do that work, um, to do that labor on behalf of all survivors. Um, and so it was really powerful. It was really beautiful um, for, to see so many people, especially if you're in this work like I am, you know, you do see a lot of people who are still victim blaming and still, saying really awful things about survivors and their families. Um, and uh, so it was really beautiful to stand outside with a bunch of people um, and, and, and just really um, love on these survivors. I think one of the things that we don't often um, remember to do in this work um, is to celebrate the fact that we're still here and we're still standing. Um, and part of something that we're always thinking about is how do we lift up not just the stories of, of the trauma and um, the healing, but also the part where we're talking about that we're still here and that we made it and that, um, you know, we, we were really brave and we were really strong and we were um, uh, vulnerable and human in all the ways that we are, but it, it, it all deserves to be honored. And so that was kind of what we were able to do and it was really incredible. Thanks for doing that. That was such great work. It was really fun to see on the news. Um, even all the way over here in Washington, I saw it. The, um, Nikki uh, put a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, okay. She says, what would you say are the hardest challenges with maintaining trauma-informed yoga for youth survivors, and what do you do to help address those challenges? And are there other trauma-informed programs that you collaborate with? Um, so... Um, the first question, one of the biggest challenges we have is attendance. Um, I think everybody can agree that when you're working with kids um, and teens, attendance is an issue. Um, once we have kids there, I don't, you know, there's um, it's behavioral challenges that um, are not insurmountable, honestly. So I don't even feel like that's like our, our biggest challenge. I think our biggest challenge is supporting families um, who are, you know, have court dates and doctor's appointments and sports things going on and actually getting them to bring their kids um, on a regular basis. Um, but I think the, what we're trying to do and what we have done that has improved that is we've started um, coordinating schedules so that when we run our caretaker support group, we're running yoga at the same time. So when our parents are already there for the caretaker support group, it actually works as a function that they're their child care, right, and also getting support services. And so they can go to caretaker support group, and then the kids can go to yoga, um, and everyone's getting what they're needed, and our attendance um, rates go up. So that's been working, and that's something that we're going to continue to do. Um, did I answer that question? <laughs> oh, and other trauma uh, programs that we collaborate with. Um, yeah, we, we collaborate with a lot of other programs. Um, most of the, the um, Angel House would be a good example. Community Mental Health would be a good example. 
um, that are trauma-informed practice or, um, programs, but also the Lansing School Di District. The reason we were able to work with them is they have a program called Project Peace. And Project Peace um, is a school environment where they actually have TFCVT um, trained therapists on site. And so that is actually a trauma-informed uh, program that we were able to participate with that, that opened the door for us to work within the school um, for the past, um, I guess it's almost been probably, a, well, it's been about a year, I think, we've been working with the school. So that's been really incredible, too. And Lydia would like to know how you use um, singing bowls, because um, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, we use the singing bowls to start and end the class. Um, we um, do walk the kids through, um, you know, I think um, not, not too intensely, um, but we do talk about um, the different chakras and the different postures. Um, and so that has been really um, helpful for um, guiding our classes. So we start at the crown chakra, um, and we'll go down to, um, you know, their feet and um, their root, you know, their roots. Um, so I'm not, I am super, I am definitely not a um, qualified to talk about chakras, but I will say that um, our yoga instructors do use that. Um, but you have to be really, um, I want to also say you do have to be aware of what's going on with your kids when you are talking about those things, because you know, we've had kids come in who um, the plan for the class that day was to talk about root chakra and being um, quote unquote grounded. Um, <laughs> and one of our kids um, just became homeless the night before. And so we were not going to talk about being rooted and grounded when our clients were in such a space of upheaval. And so just being aware, like, you know, there are so many things that are, are good and wonderful um, that don't fit in the class because of what's going on with the kids. And so um, we're really lucky in that that is the nice thing about being connected to teachers and therapists and caseworkers and probation officers and all of these people who are in the corners of these kids because um, they can sometimes walk in or call us ahead and give us um, a heads up that this thing went down for this kid's family um, and so you can expect this kind of either this kind of behavior or they're going to present in a way that they haven't present before. Um, we've had clients who, um, you know, thought that they were going to get adopted and they weren't. I mean, there's a lot of, our children deal with a lot of things that uproot them. Um, and, you know, just, just thinking through the different, um, you know, chakras that just, that just reminded me that there, you know, there, there are ways that we invite those things into our yoga sessions and in ways that, and ways that we choose not to um, based on what our clients are going through. Does that make sense? I hope so. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? Nope, nope, nope. Well, I will just say um, as we start to wrap up that the, um, I want to just, you know, when we were thinking about doing this program, we kind of, you know, we imagined it to be um, one way and to look back on the program that we started um, to what it has become now. Um, and how much we've learned in between. I just want to encourage um, all of you that if you are thinking about this kind of program or if it's something totally different, whether it's art or music, um, you know, whatever it is, that it's, there's so much about it that um, is about learning and growing with your clients and being open to um, creating something um, that is flexible and malleable um, rather than something that is, uh, very rigid. Um, and I think that that's been why this program has been um, uh, so successful in some ways and also has fit so well into other programs because we could really look and see what the needs were for each individual program and move um, in those directions um, and try to really 
create something that's going to be useful for either those families or those organizations um, or those partners. And so I think that that's been really important. So as you kind of craft your, um, your next thing, your next program, um, you know, I, I would just encourage you, because now we're at the space where we're evaluating, and I just went, we have um, regular contractor meetings that happen um, quarterly, and I, um, we have been talking about evaluation, we have all of these ideas, and we have um, grad students working on it, um, and meeting with our different contractors and our program development committee, and I finally just said, you know what, this is, these ideas are wonderful, um, and we're just going to pick some, and we're just going to give it a try. <laughs> we're just going to see how it goes. Um, we're going to pick a, a, a team. We're going to get consent from the families, uh, you know, and we're just going to go at it and see what happens and see what we can learn. Um, and our ability to be kind of innovative and, um, you know, as a grassroots organization is really um, – paid off, I think, for our clients. So I just want to encourage anybody who's thinking about it to just go for it. Um, and, and, you know, if you already are aware of how to be trauma-informed uh, or trauma-sensitive, um, in other ways, it's really not that difficult um, to use those kinds of considerations um, in other types of programs. Um, Tashmika, uh, Alana says, first, huge thank you for sharing your knowledge and passion. And um, she has a couple of questions and says, uh, for sessions with two yoga instructors, is the second instructor always waiting outside the room, or do they practice as well and manage any situations in the room? And two, are there any particular resources for trauma-informed yoga that you or your program would recommend? Thank you. Those are great questions. And you're welcome. I love talking about yoga. I'm not a yoga instructor, but I like to believe I'm a yoga evangelist. <laughs> so, um, I uh, No, yoga instructors are both doing yoga. And actually, it would be my preference to always have a second person and to always have that second person doing yoga. Um, I think it is fine and reasonable to have someone sitting out in the room regardless, whether you have two yoga instructors or one to support any of the needs of anything that happens, you know, for safety reasons. Um, but if someone is going to, um, I think if you're working with kids, and especially if you have more than, I would say, um, four or five of the little ones um, or six or seven of the older ones, you need to have two instructors in that room. I think it's really important, um, especially if you're saying to kids, you know, you don't have to do every piece of this. There needs to be some way to split off the attention um, in the room for, you know, clients who want to be active and adventurous um, and clients that maybe need to take a step back and, and be more restful in their postures um, during that time. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second question? It is, do you have, I lost it, are there any particular resources for trauma-informed yoga that you or your program would recommend? So I um, shy away from selecting an individual program um, because I think that it really, um, I, I, there, we definitely, I'm sorry, I'm stuttering because I'm like trying to think how I'm going to say this. Um, there are a lot of different yoga programs, and I think it really would be wise um, for everyone to take a look at the program and um, determine whether you would consider that program or that training um, trauma-informed um, and, you know, make sure that there's a benefit for joining that program. I think it just really depends. We have, I think, two yoga instructors who teach trauma-informed yoga here in our area. Um, one of them really focuses – um, on more like more adults um, and older teens, um, and then one focuses more on um, children, um, and and so it's just uh, or at least has more content for children. So it really just depends on the people who are teaching it. Um, there are so many offerings out there that it would just um, I feel like if I tried to recommend one or, the, one or the other at this point, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense because just like um, our evaluation process, I really feel like the yoga trainings that are out there are also steadily evolving and changing to um, match the, the current interest in trauma-sensitive yoga. Um, and so I think 
if I were go going to say what should be included, it's kind of some of the things that we've talked about here, but also thinking through um, who are they thinking about in terms of clients? Are they preparing people to work with um, people with disabilities? Are they talking about some of the things that our clients are going to face um, in terms of eating disorders or addictions? Um, is this something where they're actually going to get practice time in? Working? Is the training um, going to involve actual practice time, or um, is the training, um, you know, uh, a training specifically where they're in the yoga studio just talking about the idea of doing this work? Because working with children is very different. Um, the other thing that we've done is we have had um, our yoga assistants are usually people who don't have the training that we would necessarily want them to have to be a full instructor, um, or they don't have as much experience with children. So we've been able to um, pair them together with people who are more experienced in working with kids. I found that that is um, one of the spaces that usually needs a little improvement because most of the, the basic yoga courses really focus on um, working with, uh, in a traditional yoga setting with adults. Um, and so that's one of the, the, the places where we look to fill in some skills. Um, there's one more thing I was going to say about this. Um, yeah, I, and I, again, I want to really encourage you to get into their yoga studio and practice with them and have some conversations about your clients um, because all of our clients look differently um, and will show up differently and um, – will we'll have different needs, and I think that um, whatever training they attend uh, needs, to, needs to address, you know, your population, or at least you need, you'd need to find something that offers another layer um, to their training so that they can be equipped to work with the people you work with. That can be also a training that you offer because we offer, you know, we have definitely given our yoga instructors training in understanding child sexual trauma and um, crisis intervention and things like that too. So that's another consideration that it doesn't necessarily even, all of the pieces don't necessarily need to come from the trauma sensitive yoga training. They can also come from other areas too. We have yoga instructors that are already therapists. Um, and so they come with that background as well. So um, I feel like I just said it in a really long way, it depends again, but it really, really does. <laughs> yeah, it totally makes sense. The, oh, good. Glad. There's only one question left. It's from Lydia. Do does the instructor collaborate with victim witness program and their compensation grants? And I think, you know, maybe that means that uh, do, do you all um, get paid through, or is that is that something that's allowable through your victims' compensation fund? Do you we do not part. Yeah, we do not interact with them at this time. No, um, and most of our funding is through grant funding. But we do um, some of our programs um, also pay us to do this program. So, um, although not that particular program, but we do partner with people who have grant funding to do this work as well. Uh, and then uh, an additional question is: Are services free of charge, uh, or is it sliding scale? All of our services at this point are free of charge right now, um, and we anticipate that that will stay. Um, the state of Michigan, uh, well, it's probably not just the state of Michigan, but now that um, Medicare um, or Medicaid, which one is it? I always get them mixed up. Don't make fun of me or do it behind my back. Um, but <laughs> is now um, c covers 100% what our kids need. So we're now uh, credentialing our therapists, um, and we're hoping that that will also help us um, provide another way um, to make some program income to support our yoga programming as well, if that makes sense. Uh, and I do not see any more questions in the chat. Awesome. Well, good. If anybody has any other questions, I, um, I know there were a lot of questions around what trainings are required and things like that. I did um, send um, a um, copy of our vetting requirements, so you should get that in the email too, um, just so you can take a look at it. It's not the end all of what you might be considering for your program. Um, there are definitely some other considerations if you're working with LGBTQ youth, if you're working with um, children um, or youth with disabilities, 
if you're working with a marginalized community, um, I think that you know what your community needs, and I'm sure that they will tell you if you ask. Um, I think that those are some things that you might want to think about. Um, but if you have any questions about that or you want to be in touch, this is all my contact information. Um, and I'm happy to talk about yoga. Um, obviously, I almost did an hour and a half talking about it. So <laughs> um, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm happy to, to respond to emails. Tashmika, thank you so much. I love your program, um, uh, and I loved hearing about it. Um, it gave thank me a you. Lot of my in general, <laughs> and I hope um, that everybody else got a lot of um, ideas from this and inspiration, and really just like just little pieces of things that you said are are so important, even to just advocacy, like like the pieces you said around like not having heavy scents and not. Um, you know, and knowing where the exits are and, and just, like, using the sphere for breath. And, like, a lot of those things can be used even outside the yoga studio, just in working with um, um, child sexual abuse and even adult uh, sexual abuse survivors. So, um, really, thank you for that. A lot of great ideas. Um, Absolutely. So, folks, uh, you will be getting... 